Thank you very much to Frontera uh, for hosting the, the Knowledge Hub downstairs and also to NZ Dairy for producing that fabulous morning tea. I love the sandwiches. Uh, got a gorgeous flat white here. If you could just take your seats, we'll get right into it because we're already about five minutes late. So in this session, we'll be hearing from some of the catchment group leaders on the challenges and opportunities in their regions and their work that they've been doing to support farmers in getting to grips with regulations and protecting and managing biodiversity at different scales and uh, implementing business uh, unusual. <laughs> uh, I think I mentioned before I did the story about Selwyn River and at the time, uh, seven years ago, we were also looking possibly to, to include Southland in that story. They didn't, didn't make the cut in the end, but um, I can remember as a boy, uh, Country Calendar used to do stories about how wonderful the trout fishing was uh, near Winton and those beautiful Southland rivers uh, it were crystal clear and they had these huge big trout they were catching. And by the time we got to the 19, to the noughties, you know, that had all pretty well gone and the, and the rivers were looking pretty awful. Um, and more recently, um, Thriving Southland came along uh, and um, Thriving Southland are doing some amazing work there. Uh, and I'm about to introduce you to Richard Kite here. He's uh, originally from the Lake District in England. Richard immigrated to New Zealand in 1988 uh, with a background in dairying and consultancy. He spent seven years as a regional leader for Dairy New Zealand. And his role, along with key farmers, he's helped to initiate the Southland Catchment Group. So would you please welcome Richard Kite. Uh, thank, thank you, John. Kia ora kata. And uh, yeah, thank you for the invitation to come along here today and talk to you all, um, preaching to the converted, um, about catchment groups, but also about the thriving south of the model and some of the things we've learned um, along the way. So I'll give you a brief um, uh, recap of where thriving south and came from and, and what drove its, um, uh, I suppose, what drove it coming together. Um, it started um, probably back in uh, 2017, 18, and it was um, really this was the this was a spur for what, why it came about, and it was regulation coming at farmers, negativity, mental health, and a lot of that's still there now, and there might be one or two added uh, since we actually started, uh, but but. The, the negativity wasn't a space that our catchment group leaders uh, wanted to be in. Um, and really, when you look at where, where that was driving farmers, um, it's, well, we can see all that coming at us. We don't know. Um, we can't see the pathway forward. So how do I change if I can't see the pathway? And, and you see that pressure on people now. And then we see the other side of the coin of the other hand, and I don't know whose slide this is, but I found that online and stole it, so thanks very much, because you're probably in the room. Um, but it's, um, it, it's that risk of, of change and the risk of not changing. And we talked to, um, we went out and did some work with farmers, uh, looking at policy and looking at how it affected them. And the reality is you put one policy in place and as you, the majority of you will know, farm systems are complex. You have to work through how you integrate that into your farm system. So then you put two in place uh, and that has to work with the first one and the second one and your farm system and the, and the risk just in, increases. Um, so it's really important, I, I suppose, that Thriving South is really about the tools, not the rules. It's about looking looking what, what what's available, what you can use to work your way forward. And we're also seeing that policy starting to align now, so we're not getting hit with all these policies. It's actually um, it's starting to align. But we're, we're about actually making a difference on the ground. So when farmers or their communities make an investment in change, um, they, get, they get an outcome that they're looking for. So this is the model um, uh, that Thriving Southland put together. And it's probably a model that's, um, um, and it's, so it's not really about saying, uh, here's, here's the science, you need to do this. It's about saying, here's the science, what do you think about it? Um, it's really about good, good extension of uh, the tools that are there and the science that's there, 
working with all the partners, working with iwi, got everybody who has an interest, but putting the primary producer and their community uh, right in the centre of, of the picture. Uh, so they, they've got ownership. They've got ownership of, of, of the way forward, where they think they should head, and, there's, and it's a two-way two -way process. And, and oh, I suppose since we started, when we started out, um, uh, people thought we were driving Southland. I thought we might be able to get a, a few jobs taking people around town but, um, and pick up a bit, a bit of extra money. But, but I think over time, because it's a farmer-led, we've got a cross, there's a cross-sectoral group of farmers leading this, um, the, there's, a, there's now, we very quickly built a high level of trust. And that's really important uh, with, our, with our communities, that the trust is there when you're working with them on, on the way forward. Um, I suppose at the, at the centre of it, when you look what we're trying to achieve, and the Minister spoke about some of this, it's that low footprint but highly resilient model of, of our farm systems and our, and, and our way our catchments work. So, uh, and when you talk to, to farmers who are interested in getting in front of catchment groups, that's a real positive way forward. So it's, it's about being positive. There is pathways forward. It's not always going to be easy, but when you're working together, it certainly makes a difference. So the history of catchment groups, and there's a few people in the room who were uh, involved in the early catchment groups, they started around about 2011 and 12. Um, sector groups and key farmers who, were, who were, we were looking at regional plans coming out and thinking we need to be part of this and, part of the, and have a voice and, and understand where things are going. So by... Um, uh, and then following on from that, so this, there was support around those groups at the start, and then uh, NZ Landcare Trust came in, and that was a really important phase because they actually put structure in with those groups. What are we trying to achieve? Where are we going? And that made a big difference. So when uh, Thriving Southland uh, appeared on the scene in um, uh, 2019, um, really the, there were about 18 groups going, and and they, they were they had direction they had a forum so there was there's was plenty to work with there and the and the idea was to ramp up what we what we had what was there and so there's four um freshwater management unit coordinators that's sort of changed a bit um over time but there's four full full-time equivalents working in the team so it's actually getting in and I suppose you'll, you'll all know this, I'm not, uh, it's not you know, I'm, I say I'm preaching to converted, but most of those catchment groups have got two to three key people, or maybe four or five, who actually have to put all the energy into that. And it's really difficult to keep things moving and keep things going. So by putting the coordinators in alongside, that ramped that up. Two project support staff, so when they've got a project uh, and they're running a project, they actually get... Um, they don't have to deal with the nitty-gritty. The, 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 our project manager from Thriving South and deals with all that. They're just dealing with the getting on and doing what, they're, the, what they've set out to achieve. Uh, we're there to support the outcomes. It's an outcomes-based uh, model. You'll see this. Um, I'm the first up. I've been last up in a catchment group um, forum before, and I could say uh, most of the stuff, you'll, you'll see this, but it's so important um, over and over again. Uh, these are the really important points that we found, and so the last meeting I was at, I spoke last and said, oh, we can go for your lunch because you've heard it. But um, it's, uh, and, and people will speak more to this during this conference, but that support, engagement, the science, and people, you know, you hear over and over again people saying, oh, science is, is always changing, and should we, but actually it's about science in the right place and the right time. Cooperation, clarity, and reducing um, duplication. So on that initial slide, it's about being there and coordinating all the, um, all the um, uh, parties that are interested and are there to help and are there to move things along from regional council, iwi, to the sector groups, to, to um, we, you know, we work with, um, we've had Cawthron working for groups, we've had, all, we've had um, Ag research. So there's a whole group of people wanting to get in and actually make a difference, and and it's that conduit onto the ground to the groups. Um, local knowledge. People want to understand what was there before. Really important and funding. Um, so it's act, it is 
the, the basis of this is it's farmer led. It's not thriving Southland led. Um, I remember early on when we came up with a great project, the Thriving Southland team, and put it in front of a, uh, a rather large catchment group who told us quite quickly what to do with it. Um, <laughs> but, but the interesting thing was, when we put all the information in front of them and said, you come up with a catchment project and you, that, that actually fits what you're doing and what you, you want to look at, they own that project now. They actually own it. And, and, and that's the key thing. They own it and they, they're there for their outcomes. They're, 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 they're passionate about getting the outcomes because those projects belong to them. Um, some of the work we did in science, um, knowing, knowing the science that actually matters to you, in Southland, there's a lot of um, there's a lot of noise around the the water quality and what a problem it is, and 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 farmers yeah, but where, what, and how, and and so one of the projects we had, we pulled together after being asked from the groups, we just want to know what it actually means. We we got all the um, water quality science, which I couldn't understand, you know, the outcomes from that. Uh, and we, we got a group to pull that together and put it in layman's terms, which meant I have to be able to read it and understand it. So that was uh, 164 pages. And um, I had one farmer said to me, brilliant. Um, and then we had a whole lot more farmers say, actually, that's great for Southland, but we actually want to know about our community and where we are. So that information has now been broken down into subcatchment group water quality information. I'm going to run out of time if I'm not careful. Um, so these, this is the breadth of some of the projects we're doing. Um, and, and every one of them is important, but every one of them is owned by a catchment group. Uh, MCI testing, that gets um, really people engaged in what's happening on the ground. Um, some of the, um, the science that's going into farmers, this is looking at um, uh, you can see on the, um, this, this piece here, that's using satellite to work out over the years where, what, what um, areas of land are moving, and then you make decisions around planting, etc. cetera. Uh, we also funded through AGMAT um, a project looking, um, looking at your landscape using radiometric data. So radiations, I'm not a scientist, so if you've got any questions later, you might have to save them for the, the scientists. But looking at, uh, at radiation coming out of the ground, you can actually look at your, and, and I suppose, I'll just go, won't be. If you look at that, that's, um, that sums it up. That's um, the Waikato and Waipa in flood. Um, same farm systems going on, but different issues. So the, the one on the right, they've got sediment E. coli. That's what they need to focus on. On the left, you know, those uh, volcanic soils, uh, they need to focus on their um, uh, nitrates. And so case studies, sheep and beef farms, looking at, looking at nitrous oxide, um, areas of, um, of risk. And just because it's glowing red doesn't mean it is glowing red. That's just the, uh, the far end of the key. Um, the overlaying that with phosphate, sediment loss, and, and then it comes back to the farmer. So we, ha we go there, we do the case study, we talk about all the options around that, and then they identify the areas, you know, the key points of mitigation are identified, the key areas of end loss, they can, they can move the system, they can change the system, we put in um, farm advisors around that, and then forestry advisors. So we won't, I'll go one minute. Um, this is a dairy uh, farm we looked at. That, that's a terrace there. So there's high nitrogen loss there. The aquifer's losing nitrates off the terrace. So we, the, the, the outcome of that was that he said, well, let's put a wetland in here to start with our nitrate mitigations. Um, and when you look at that at catchment scale, that terrace runs through the whole catchment down into the Matara River. So the opportunities around that are really quite, um, you know, they're, they're quite great from a catchment scale. Balfour catchment, again, it's, this is an issue where for years they've been saying uh, the Balfour fan, there's a, there's a confined aquifer underneath it, and, um, but, but so what for the farmer? You know, I can't do anything about that. So we, they're also looking at the sediment loss. And then... Um, and they also ground truth it because farmers like to know that what you're telling them is correct. So there's a lot of ground truthing going on in this work. Um, they've paid to dig the holes, take the samples, understand that what, what we see is what we get. Uh, and then you start seeing them 
under this is one farm. You can see the red areas are high nitrate loss area and, and the, the, the soils to the south are less leaky. So that's where um, the farmer then starts making decisions and starts looking at how do I change and move that. So what sits behind our project is we, early on we engage with cane changers, uh, cane growers on the Great Barrier Reef. They initiated a similar sort of uh, model which is putting the information on the ground with the farmers and this was the outcome. So after four and a half years, a 350% increase in accreditation, you can spot the model that's engaged. So that, that's, uh, well, there's obviously questions later, but I say this is what happens when you put the information with the people who need to use it. So I say thanks, um, uh, thanks for the opportunity to speak and thanks for MPI because the model we've got is also, um, it's not the easiest to run uh, from a policy and, and funding perspective but the people who've worked with us along the way to make it work of, of you know, that's, that's really important. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Richard. Uh, you'll, and you'll have an opportunity to ask him more questions. Uh, it's great to see a farmer-led program like that and uh, using science to um, make decisions.